Coming up on Dr. Kiki's Science Hour, we're talking about experimental philosophy, or X5 for short. That's up next on Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Dr. Kiki's Science Hour is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. Three, two, one. This is Dr. Kiki's Science Hour with me, Dr. Kiki Sanford. Episode 120, recorded Thursday, November 10th, 2011. The X Files. This episode of Dr. Kiki's Science Hour is brought to you by Ford, featuring voice-activated Sync AppLink. Now you can control select smartphone apps with your voice, so you keep your hands on the wheel and your eyes on the road. Check it out in the 2012 Ford Fiesta and at Ford.com slash technology. And by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All streamed directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com forward slash twit. Welcome to Dr. Kiki Science Hour. I am Dr. Kiki Sanford, and this is the show where we get to focus on one topic in science with an expert for the duration of the show, nearly an hour, which is pretty exciting, right? You have to admit, it's rare in media these days that you get to go so deeply into a subject for such a wonderful period of time. I hope you're ready, because today's show... We're going to be talking about experimental philosophy, where philosophy gets out of the armchair and it takes to the streets to discover the fundament fundamental truths of the universe. And my guest today is Dr. Joshua Nob from Yale University. But first, as always, before we get into the fun conversation, I have a few science headlines for you. It's time to update the periodic table. Well over a decade after being discovered, the heavy elements numbered 110, 111, and 112 have finally been named by the International Union of Pure and Applied Physics. Number 110, temporarily named Ananilium, is now Darmstadium. Ananunium, or number 111, is now Röntgenium. And Anunbium, the feisty number 112, is called Copernicium. Or Copernicium more correctly. Plain-tailed wrens sing better together. According to a study published in the journal Science, in which researchers recovered activity in the bird's higher vocal center, these little wrens' brains react more strongly to duets and to female songs, supporting the idea that females take the lead in this highly choreographed vocal dance. Spotted horses depicted in Paleolithic cave paintings were most likely based on spotted horses that the cave painters saw in their environment rather than being symbolic or abstract art. A study in the Proceedings of the National Academies of Sciences found that ancient horses in Siberia and Europe had a gene associated with leopard-like spots that we see today in modern horses. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration released its annual Greenhouse Gas Index, which reports an increase from 1.27 in 2009 to 1.29 in 2010. This increasing number is influenced by increases in atmospheric carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and decreases in two chlorofluorocarbons. Scientists at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands have created the world's smallest four-wheeled car. The nano-sized vehicle uses electron power to propel itself across a copper surface. It's described in the journal Nature. And a paper published in the archive.org database posits that our solar system was formed as the result of a supernova explosion. That's right, the blast wave from the explosion, which would have occurred about 15 light years away from where we are now, would have caused the collapse of the exploded stars surrounding dust and gas cloud and seeded the creation of our sun. It's just an idea but kind of neat. A study published in JAMA this week, the Journal of, for the American Medical Association, suggests that autism might have something to do with the numbers of cells 
in the brain. The researchers found 67% more brain cells in the prefrontal cortex of boys with autism compared to boys without the disorder. The prefrontal cortex is important for language, communication, as well as social interactions. And that does it for the science news this week. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our sponsor. This episode of Dr. Kiki Science Hour is brought to you by Ford, featuring available voice-activated Sync AppLink. Sync AppLink enables you to control select apps from your smartphone with simple voice commands while you keep your hands on the wheel and your eyes on the road. With Sync AppLink, you can do things like voice control Pandora in your car. Listen to your tweets with OpenBeak just by asking with a simple voice command. Once your smartphone is linked to Pandora, for example, you can use voice commands to select your favorite station, make a new one, bookmark songs to purchase, give songs a thumbs up or thumbs down. Some of the voice commands include PlayStation Classic Rock, bookmark song, thumbs up, or thumbs down. And with Open Beak, for example, you can say read timelines or read replies. Sync App Link is built on an API platform that allows Ford to continue to work with developers in the app community to bring apps to life with voice in their v- in their vehicles. Voice activated Sync App Link is available in the 2012 Ford Fiesta. You can learn more at Ford Tech app link uh, about this and other technologies Ford is bringing to its vehicles at ford.com slash technology. And now into our guest conversation for the day. Joshua Nob is a professor at Yale University in both the program in cognitive science and the Department of Philosophy. His research focuses on systematic experimental studies designed to figure out how people actually go about making moral judgments. He's co-editor with Sean Nichols of the book Experimental Philosophy. Welcome to the show, Josh. It's great to have you here today. Great to be talking with you, Dr. Kiki. Yeah, it's really it's good to be able to have this conversation. We had some we had some scheduling back and forth, but we finally got it <laughs> got it in the calendar. So just to start, I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with philosophy or, or the idea of, of of studying philosophy, but isn't the, the I the idea of philosophy is that you don't experiment? What is this experimental philosophy that you're doing? Do you know, if you look at philosophy within the 20th century, you often see this idea that philosophy is somehow divorced from questions in the sciences, so that no matter what it turns out about how people actually think or feel about questions, that should be sort of irrelevant. We can just address these philosophical questions purely from the armchair. But when you look at it further, you can see that's actually a relatively recent idea in the history of philosophy. If you go back to the 19th century, say, to the work of people like Nietzsche or Marx or John Stuart Mill, you find that these people were very involved in studying the philosophical and scientific questions of their day and didn't really draw a deep distinction between questions that were scientific and those that were philosophical, but just tried to use all the resources at their disposal to go after the questions that they saw as important. So I think you can see the experimental philosophy movement as a kind of retro movement that's mm. trying to bring philosophy back to this historical way that it traditionally was. And you can go back to the very, very beginnings of, of philosophy with um, with Plato and 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 other early philosophers who uh, they 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 used a somewhat experimental uh, per, uh, uh, per paradigm, didn't they? Exactly. So if you look at the work of Aristotle, for example, you find that. He didn't at all distinguish purely philosophical questions from scientific questions, but he was very involved in asking these kind of experimental questions that involved issues in biology that he would try to address by actually going to the ocean and trying to gain information about sea creatures and the movements of animals and so forth. It's that very spirit that we're trying to bring back by sort of reinvigorating this idea that science can be relevant to philosophical questions. Is there a, a, a hard dividing line between science and philosophy, or do you, do you see them as a continuum? See, my own view is that this sense that there is a sharp dividing line has only been really help, harmful to our discipline. That what's really important to think about is not the difference between these disciplines, but rather about these questions. Once we understand what a certain question is, we should just try to use every method we can to kind of address the question as best we can. 
So you're a, a proponent of uh, of integration rather than it, division. Yeah, exactly. How do you? I mean, how how are you? How is this being received by the scientific community, by the philosophical community at large? I mean, um, it it seems. I, I mean, this integration of science, experimentation, philosophy. Um, it, it seems like it would be something somewhat controversial based on where we are in our current in our current discussions. Yeah, it's very funny. So I have this kind of dual role of being both um, in the Department of Cognitive Science and in the Department of Philosophy. And the very same thing that I'm doing is seen as extremely normal and uncontroversial insofar as I call it cognitive science and insofar as it gets published in psychology journals. Mm -hmm. But insofar as that very same thing is being published in philosophy journals or insofar as I'm considered as a philosophy professor, mm -hmm. then it becomes very controversial. And it becomes the sort of source of this heated and polarized debate about which sort of side is right and so forth. <laughs> so in, in term, in, it, it basically depends on if you're publishing experiments in experimental journals, that's all fine. But experiments in philosophy journals, it's like, what? You know, you've got exactly the right idea that there will be a research program that consists of a series of different papers. Some of those papers published in psychology journals, some published in philosophy journals. Often both paper groups of papers will be co-authored by philosophers and psychologists. But insofar as you try to publish in the philosophy journals, then you're setting off this kind of sense of, of a battle or something where there's this sense of this being very controversial. Then insofar as you're publishing the very same thing and calling it psychology, then it's considered perfectly normal. Hmm. I love the idea of this, of the battle of philosophers. It's <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's a very funny thing about the discipline of philosophy is that uh, it's a very, there's a sense in philosophy that people can disagree and be somewhat heated in their disagreement, but that people treat these disagreements in a really, really different way from what we'd find in disagreements about religion or about politics and so forth. Mm -hmm. So that those who disagree with experimental philosophy, they provide reasons why they think it's mistaken, but always in a very uh, respectful or thoughtful or rational way. And we can just sort of sit down and talk about it. In that way, the sense of there being a fight is very different from the sense that there could be a fight about, say, uh, the culture war in America today. Right, right. It would be it would be very different. In terms of... Uh... Of, of how you got into philosophy. So the, the area you're, you're in, more looking at moral judgments, uh, try and, and how you've gotten into this uh, experimental philosophy. Where did, where did all this come from? How did you end up being such a, you know, a, a young upstart, I guess? Oh, you know, so these kind of questions, I entered in a sort of indirect way. So when I first began thinking about philosophy, I was obsessed with these sort of figures in the history of philosophy, people like Nietzsche, Spinoza, Hume, Aristotle. I wanted to do something kind of along these same lines. But at the same time, um, I was doing research just in psychology and just publishing papers in psychology journals. So I was sort of doing both of these things at the same time of being interested in these very traditional questions in philosophy and writing psychology papers. But then at some point I decided I'm going to leave behind this this work that I'm doing in um, psychology and I'm going to enter a graduate school in philosophy. But then something sort of strange happened that I entered, um, that uh, someone decided to write from philosophy a reply to this work that I'd been doing in psychology, but to treat that work as though it was just a perfectly ordinary contribution to philosophy. So this philosophy professor took up this work from a psychology journal and said, you know, these things are right and these things are wrong, but treated it as though it was philosophically relevant. And as I started looking at this reply, I thought, maybe some of the things that this guy is saying are right are actually wrong. So I wanted to decided I'm going to disprove the view that we had before. And then we wrote about it in these various psychology journals. But this time, to treat the question as a philosophical question in its own right and see if we could kind of what we could do to kind of address it philosophically when you look at at stuff in philosophy journals versus looking at stuff in psychology journals um do you change the way that that you that you question it is there or do you come at whatever you're looking at with a philosophical uh, uh training and philosophical um uh 
approach so that the way you would ask a question, is it different? Yeah, maybe what happens is that we end up using much the same methods that you would see in any kind of psychology paper, but that the kind of questions that we pose end up being ones that you wouldn't normally think of if you just had a background in psychology. So we can, insofar as you've spent some time studying things from the history of philosophy, you can introduce new questions to the world of psychology that maybe you wouldn't have ordinarily thought of if you had just been like spending your time in um, psychology departments. Right. So the the study that you ended up doing, um, you kind of you you, you, beca- you became it became named for you the results for that the Nob effect, and um, I have a, a video that was done by a comedian uh, that explains the Nob effect. So um, we're going to watch the video, and then if there's anything that um, you want to comment on after the video, we can we can discuss that. Okay. okay. Mm. Experimental philosophy is a new form of philosophy that involves actually doing experiments on how people think and feel. Let's look at two cases. For one simple example, consider the following scenario. The vice president of a company comes to the president of a company with a proposal for a new program. We are thinking about starting a new program. It will maximize profits, Mm -hmm. but it will also harm the environment. Look, I know that this program will harm the environment, but I don't care at all about that. All I care about is maximizing the profits. So let's start the program. The plan is put into effect, and sure enough, the environment is harmed. Now ask yourself, did the corporate executive harm the environment intentionally? Now that you've thought up an answer to this question, try thinking of a second variation. In this, we keep everything exactly the same. The only thing we change is the word harm to help. I wonder what happens. We are thinking about starting a new program. It will maximize profits, Mm -hmm. and it will also help the environment. Look, I know that this program will help the environment, but I don't care at all about that. All I care about is maximizing the profits. So let's start the program. The plan is put into effect, and sure enough, the environment is helped. Now in this new version, ask yourself, did the corporate executive help the environment intentionally? Strangely enough, most people say that the act of harming is intentional, while the act of helping is unintentional. But it seems like the only difference is in the moral character of what the executive did. How could this moral difference possibly be changing people's views on whether the act was intentional or unintentional? So that's the uh, the question there. How how does the how does the situation affect the judgment? So what's really surprising in this kind of example is the idea that we would have expected that the question as to whether you did something intentionally would be entirely independent of your moral judgments about it. That Mm -hmm. you just be able to figure out whether you did it intentionally in a way that didn't involve morality at all. But it seems like even these questions that seem like they're just purely scientific questions are somehow being impacted in a funny way by people's moral judgments, their judgments about what's morally right or morally wrong. And so it's basically whatever the person feels about stuff they are putting their own put basically putting themselves in the place of the of the person and saying that that person must be a bad person because they if they have the same worldview as i do they're bad or they did it intentionally right so it seems as though people's judgments about whether the person did something that was morally good or morally bad are somehow affecting their intuitions about 
whether what the person did was something intentional or unintentional. And it's really a puzzling, interesting matter to think, why is this happening? So it's like, there's a sense that there's a kind of mystery. You wouldn't think that whether you did it intentionally or unintentionally has anything to do with whether it's morally good or morally bad. And there have been a whole series of experiments trying to test out different hypotheses, like, for example, the one you just mentioned, as to why exactly this might be happening. What kind of experiments? Like, what, what, what are people, what are the questions that are being asked? And is there any, any insight that's coming from them? Yeah, here's an interesting example. So many people thought what might be going on in these cases is that people's intuitions are being affected by their emotions. That when you hear the story of this guy harming the environment, it just makes you upset. And you just think, how could he do that, that bastard? Then yeah. you make him, you make the attribution that he did it intentionally. So Leanne Young and colleagues thought maybe that was right. So they decided to do a study in which they ran the exact same experiment on people who had uh, deficits in emotional response because of lesions in this particular brain region, the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. Hmm. So people have lesions in this brain region. These are the people whose plight is popularized in Antonio Damasio's book, Descartes' Error. They have tremendous deficits in the capacity to feel ordinary emotional responses. But what Lian Yang and colleagues showed was that these people still show the exact same effect. They say that the person harmed intentionally but that, that he helped unintentionally. So they concluded maybe the effect actually wasn't due to emotion after all. Maybe it's this purely cognitive sort of effect. Huh, I wonder what, would it, what aspects of cognition would actually lead, lead to that, uh, that kind of a bias. That, that's a really interesting, interesting result. Right, so a lot of the question has been about specifically whether it should be understood even as a bias mm -hmm. or whether we're mistaken to think in the first place that these kinds of judgments are non-moral. Maybe really our whole way of kind of making sense of other people is infused with moral qualities from the very beginning. Right. And so did they, are the, I wonder, have there any, been any studies done on not just people who are not really able to feel their, feel their own emotions, but um, who don't really read emotions in other people? Right, exactly. So there was a really interesting experiment about this case recently from Tiziana Dalla, in which she looked at patients who have Asperger's syndrome. So these are people who have a lot of difficulty in understanding other people's minds. Yeah. And she gave them this exact case, which she found was something really striking. So most people like you, for example, probably think that the person deserves blame for harming the environment, but doesn't deserve any praise for helping the environment. Mm -hmm. So there's a kind of asymmetry that you think he deserves blame in one case, but doesn't deserve praise in the other case. But people with Asperger's syndrome show no asymmetry. They think it, the person deserves just as much praise for helping as blame for harming, that there's no difference between the two. I wonder if also, what if you got rid of profit so that uh, you, profit in itself would seem to be some kind, it would seem to be a another motivator or would be, mm -hmm. even though it's controlled across the two, the two situations, it's still something that, um, in the case of the the CEO saying all I care about is money, that is, it's it's putting the CEO in a in a place where you can judge him from the beginning. Like there was some, there was somebody in the in the chat room who was like, ah, just that person's got bad morals. That person just being all profit, they're not that they're not a good person. <laughs> oh yeah, you know it's a really interesting question whether it matters whether this person is a good person, and. The results seem to suggest that it doesn't matter. All that matters is what the person's doing in this one action. So for example, mm -hmm. suppose we tell people other information about this guy, just about his life. So he goes into the office and he either helps or harms the environment. Then he comes home and in one condition we, we could tell participants, you know, he helps out his wife with the dishes, then he helps his kids with the homework, then he like pets the dog. Then in the other condition, he goes into the office and helps or harms the environment. Then he comes home and he starts screaming at his wife. Then he like kicks the dog and starts yelling at his kids. The truth is that that kind of manipulation has no impact at all on whether they think he did it intentionally. The only thing that has an impact is whether the actual thing he was doing was something morally good or morally bad. 
Wow. That's really, that's really interesting. So from this now, we have this, what, what's called the, the side effect effect um, that you're calling this, that we have this situation where people are, are putting the, these judgments onto people based on their own, uh, their own morals, where they stand. Um, what do we do with this knowledge? And if we don't understand it completely, you know, is, is there anything that we can that we can still use it for? Yeah, I think that this is telling us something really striking about the way that human beings typically understand the world. So a common view within cognitive science is that our basic way of understanding the world is something like the way scientists understand the world. So the way that human beings try to make sense of what's going on around them is to come up with explanations that are predictive in just the way that a scientist might come up with explanations when confronted with similar kind of phenomena. And uh, this kind of approach has been applied with great success, actually, in many different domains. But this kind of effect that we see here seems to be calling that view into question. It's suggesting that maybe our ordinary way of making sense of the world isn't like the way a scientist makes sense of the world. Maybe our ordinary way is sort of infused with these kinds of moral judgments. So mm -hmm. when we first started doing this kind of study, we were just interested in this one particular question about intentional action. But you see this exact same effect arising in numerous other domains. If you ask someone whether a person knows something, whether something is innate, whether one thing caused another, whether someone did something by doing something, whether a person's happy, what a person's true self is, in each of these cases, you see moral judgment playing a role. So it seems like there's this really pervasive way in which our whole understanding of the world isn't like the scientific understanding that it's infused with some sort of moral notions or normative considerations. Has anyone done any studies with kids? Yeah, so you, the exact kind of study that I did, that I just described yeah. with um, the environment, can't be done with children because you can't say, you know, okay, little Johnny, here's like a CEO at a corporation. But you can take a parallel kind of situation mm -hmm. that makes sense to children. So here's what you do. You say that there's a little child and he has a frog and he wants to bring the frog home because he really likes frogs. But he knows in one condition that his friend Janine also really likes frogs and she'll be really happy if she brings the if he brings the frog home. However, he doesn't care at all about Janine. He just wants to bring home the frog because he likes frogs. Mm. So did he make Janine happy on purpose? And now consider the opposite case. He's going to bring home the frog because he really likes frogs. And he knows that Janine will be really mad if he brings the frog home because Janine really hates frogs. <laughs> so then he says, I don't care at all about Janine. I just want to bring home the frog because I like frogs. So did he make Janine mad on purpose? If you ask these questions to children at three years of age, you see a funny effect. So if you say he does not care at all about Janine, does he care about Janine? They start to sort of you know, uh, nod their heads. Yeah, he does. So they just seem to not even understand the idea that he could not care about something. Right. But by around four years of age, Alan Leslie and colleagues have shown they do understand the idea of not caring, and they already show this effect. They say he made Janine mad on purpose, but he made Janine happy not on purpose. Wow, so at four years old, you're starting to see, you see this effect. That's right. So Alan Leslie argued that provides evidence that maybe it's innate, that it's not something that we learn. Or, I mean, four years is a long time and kids pick up a lot of stuff. So, I mean, there's, there could definitely be some, there, some amount of learning going on during that time period. Right. It's very difficult to assess. Yeah. The argument that he made when he said that, it, that we have reason to think it's not learned is this, that at three years of age, they don't understand the idea of not caring. So they can't even understand the question about a person who doesn't care. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as they understand what the story is, that it involves someone who doesn't care, they already show the asymmetry. So there's no period in which they're gradually learning. As soon as they even understand what question they're being asked, at that moment, they already show the effect. Right. For the, uh, for, for the effect with adults and everything, um, I just would bring that the idea that 
we, we've probably seen a lot of parallels to this, you know, uh, to this example actually in the real world. Have you have you talked at all with with people about with your colleagues or even in the writing that you've done uh, about what we've actually seen occurring in our own economy with the bankers and the uh, mortgage situations and um, and and the economy that w- here in the United States? Right. So I'm, I'm actually working right now with um, a colleague, Scott Shapiro, about the implications of this kind of work for the law. And one thing that's really interesting is that this example that you we discussed earlier actually came up and it came before the Supreme Court. So Shell Oil Corporation did something that it knew was going to harm the environment, but it wasn't trying in any way to harm the environment. Mm. Shell was just interested in um, transporting certain chemicals through a certain location. And the Supreme Court had to decide in that case, did it, was it correct to say that Shell was intentionally harming the environment? And the result was eight to one that they said that Shell was not intentionally harming the environment. Only Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg said that they were intentionally harming. Hmm. Yeah, I'm I'm sure that if we looked, we'd see all sorts of examples and we will see the effect that you're talking about played out on the Supreme Court, played out in the way that the media writes about, uh, writes about situations, uh, the way that uh, just conversations happen in cafes and bars and around the dinner table. Yeah, it's very striking that when um, the economy had all of these problems, people immediately thought it must be someone's fault, that someone must be to blame for it. No one thought it might be acceptable to explain this phenomenon just by saying, well, we can write out some complicated equations involving macroeconomic issues, and that will explain it. Whereas when the economy is doing well, people don't seem to have that same intuition. They don't think there must be a conspiracy of people working behind the scenes to make the economy work out really well. Yeah. In terms of, uh, you mentioned blame. Um, In terms of blame, having to blame something for negative stuff, but not blaming something for the positive. Uh, have you gotten into the evolutionary explanations for that? Do you do you deal much on exp- uh, evolutionary levels? You know, I haven't actually been doing that kind of work, but some of my colleagues who work in primatology have been interested mm-hmm. in these sorts of questions. And it looks like you see judgments of blame arising much earlier in the phylogenetics um, scale than you see these kinds of praise behaviors. So if you look at other primates, you do see these kind of blaming behaviors, but not the corresponding behaviors of, uh, of praise. So one thing you can even see is that other primates don't seem to even be able to understand the, this idea of you having intentions and beliefs and so forth, insofar as you're trying to help them out but only to be able to use that kind of capacity when they're in a competition with you, when they're trying to fight against you in some way. So it might be that we, um, in evolution, first developed this ability to to find bad acts and blame people for them, and then only subsequently developed this other capacity, the capacity to notice that people had good acts and deserve praise for them. Hmm. So maybe we're in the middle of uh, mm-hmm. uh, I guess a social cognitive evolution uh, mm-hmm. and realizing that good acts, maybe we should praise people more. Right. It does seem like there's um, a really striking difference between the way people think about these different kinds of acts. That if, um, for example, if someone does something good for you, but they weren't at all trying to do that, you don't feel an overwhelming temptation to praise them for it anyway, which you have to somehow grit your teeth and suppress. Yeah. But no. Consider the opposite kind of case. Suppose someone does something to, that harms you, but you recognize that it was a complete accident and that there was no way the person could have foreseen it. Then it's very hard, it's very difficult for us to respond without blaming the person. We have to really focus on keeping in our minds the idea that this person had no way of knowing this. So if you look, for example, at children, mm-hmm. you can see the developmental pathway is very different. That children only after a long number of years are able to really get this idea that you shouldn't be blaming people for things that they didn't do on purpose and have no way of preventing. But they're very easily able to understand the idea that if someone was trying to harm you and didn't succeed, then they still deserve blame for it. Right, right. Um, Do they, do they get, if you, do you have to teach them more that they, uh, to praise people? 
to praise their other classmates or, you know, is that, I, I wonder if that's harder for kids to learn than the blaming. You know, that's a really interesting question. I don't know if anyone has worked on that kind of issue. One thing about that you can see about blame is that it arises even before children could potentially be taught anything by anyone. Yeah. So if you look at studies of babies, then you see that if babies are shown a little puppet show in which one character harms another character, then if a third character can either help or harm the one who did the harming, babies prefer the character who harms the harmer. In other words, babies think that that anyone who harms another person ought to be punished and shouldn't be helped. So even before the time in which anyone's giving them moral lessons or telling them stories from the Bible or anything or like that. that. You, yeah, that, or that you, if they are, that you'd think that the babies would be even be able to really understand what they're being told. Oh, well, these, these babies don't know English. They're clearly yeah. not able to understand <laughs> anything. But they can still, even at that young age, understand that that if someone does something bad, that person shouldn't be helped out. That person needs to be punished. And mm -hmm. this seems to be something that arises long before the time at which we can sort of tell people anything about morality. Yeah. It seems like we have a kind of impulse to blame that when we see something bad happening, we feel immediately drawn at this instinctive level to blame someone for it. And no one needs to teach us to do this. Even if they taught us to not do it, we'd still continue doing it. So learning this about, uh, you know, about humans, like what, what kind of, what kind of insights do you get philosophically from this? Where do you, where do you go with this information? Well, there, one of the main sort of ideas coming out of um, philosophy is this idea that science is able to answer the ordinary questions that we face about our life. So a common view would be that, for example, we might ordinarily wonder what makes people happy and that we can answer that question. We can address the question about what makes people happy, our ordinary question, by engaging in a scientific investigation. Mm -hmm. But what we are trying to suggest is that maybe that's not really true. Maybe the ordinary questions that people are asking, when ordinarily someone says, for example, did that person do it intentionally? Or did he know that? Or did this cause that? Or will this make this person happy? Or who is he really deep down? that these questions actually have a kind of moral significance. So for example, maybe it's not possible to really say whether a person is truly happy in the sense that we ordinarily mean it, unless we engage in a kind of moral question about whether this person is leading a good life, that we don't ordinarily mean this in a purely scientific sense that could be answered, say, just by using neuroscientific studies of the person. Right. I'm going to take an opportunity to, uh, to thank our sponsor for a second, and when we when we come back to the conversation, I'd love to talk a bit about finding our true selves, which is another topic that is really interesting that you that you work on. This episode of Dr. Kiki Science Hour is brought to you by Netflix. Netflix streams thousands of TV episodes and movies directly to you, saving you time, hassle, and time, money, and hassle. There are several easy ways to instantly access streaming movies and TV shows with Netflix. You can watch Netflix movies and TV shows on your Mac or your PC, iPad, your iPhone, uh, some Android phones as well. And if you have a gaming console like an Xbox 360 or a PS3, Nintendo Wii, something like that, you can watch Netflix right on your TV. Also, set-top boxes like the Roku, Roku box, the Apple TV box, they're inexpensive, easy to use, and allow you to watch Netflix on your TV. With Netflix, you can watch movies and TV shows instantly using any of these devices and you can stop watching in the middle of your show at any point and then pick it up where you left off on a new device so you don't have to spend time trying to figure out where you were in a show it makes it very very convenient Whichever way you choose to access Netflix, you can watch as many movies and TV shows as you want any time you want, and you can cancel at any time. So try Netflix today for 30 days free. Go to netflix.com slash twit. Be sure to use this URL when you sign up for your free trial. It's netflix, N-E-T-F-L-I-X dot com slash twit, T-W-I-T. We thank Netflix for their support of, tw of Twit and Dr. Kiki Science Hour and hope that you enjoy watching instantly with Netflix. 
Now back to the show. I'm talking with Dr. Joshua Nob from Yale University about the Nob effect, which is the side effect effect. And uh, I'd love to get into the, the, the topic of our true selves. There's in philosophy, uh, there's wonderful questions, of free will versus determinism and, you know, and what is really your true self? Do we have a true self, Josh? But I don't know if I can tell you whether we have a true self, but I can tell you a lot about how people ordinarily think about the true self. Okay, tell me. <laughs> so one idea you might have about how people think about the true self is that, that your true self is something like the emotions that you have deep down or the suppressed urges and so forth. And then the opposite idea you might have, for example, would be that the true self is our capacity for reasoning and thinking clearly about questions. But what we tried to, what we showed in a series of studies is that people's intuitions about whether something is really part of a person's true self depend on their views, not just about whether it's due to emotion or to reason, but to whether this thing that the people are doing is actually something good or something bad. Hmm. So for example, suppose that a person is homosexual and really wants to um, be sleeping with other men, but at the same time, he's Christian and believes that to do so would be morally wrong and that he should refrain from doing that. When participants are asked about these two aspects of himself, the emotion he has drawing him towards sleeping with other men and the belief he has that's drawing him away from that, and are asked which of those two is his true self, what you find is that people who are conservatives say that his belief is the true self, and those who are liberal say the emotion is the true self. In other words, each side is saying that the part that corresponds to what they think is morally good, that's the thing that he really is deep down. There was a, an article by uh, Chopra, uh, and he suggested that this duality, that maybe the true self is when they come together. So instead of having the, uh, you know, the emotional versus the other, it's, you know, that when you actually find a way to bring this together after years of self-introspection and, um, and thinking about it, that that's when you find your true self. What do you think about yes. that? So I was, I was sort of amused to have a reply to our work from Deepak Chopra, and I'm, it's great that you were able to find it. So what he thought is that even though we might see him on the surface to be kind of conflicted, that deep down there's something within us that is um, completely unified so that we really feel um, that uh, deep down there's some part of us that's not in conflict and that if we could just sort of reflect on these things for longer, maybe through meditation or something like that, we come to this unified source. And what I think is that in saying that, he's sort of really getting at something deep about how people ordinarily conceive of the self. That people don't think that deep down you are conflicted that deep down you're sort of pulled one way and also pulled the other, that people really think exactly the way he suggested, that even though you might seem conflicted on the surface, whatever is the truly good thing, there's some voice deep within you calling you in a unified way always to take that thing. Right, and until you find that, if you're following only the rational or only the emotional side of, of your mind, then you're not truly going to find happiness. Right, I think that people do think that way. So that, for example, if one person is um, uh, is a liberal and the other person is a conservative, each of them will think that deep down within the other side, there's this voice calling them to the, to the truth, you know, the opposite side. And that if only that voice within them, if only they could listen to it, then they'd be able to be at peace and they would, everything within them would be reconciled. But it doesn't seem that there's too much scientific evidence for this inner voice of the good. <laughs> yeah. I know, the scientific evidence for the, the, the good angel on your shoulder keeping you, right. keeping you in line. <laughs> you know, maybe the, this m metaphor actually is, is an interesting one. So there's the metaphor of, the, of having an angel on one shoulder and having a devil on the other shoulder. Yeah. And that makes it seem like they're just parallel. They're just two different voices within you. But I don't think people think of it that way. Instead, it seems like they think, the angel is what's really deep within you, and the devil is just this thing sort of on the surface. And then if you could get rid of the devil, then the angel would just shine through and you'd be the person that you truly are. Right. I, I don't know. I like to think of it as you have these two. I like, I like them both sitting equally. 
I, th- I think they. Uh, have, I think in my mind, I've got equal voices going on. <laughs> Sometimes a little devil talks a little bit more. <laughs> yeah. In, how would you, um, you know, approach? I guess you just in, in the experimental approach. You just you're asking people about their responses, like you explained with the um, the, the the gay Christian um, example and the the. Liberals and conservatives find using their own morals to to guide their response to that. Um, you know, how else are people approaching questions like this experimentally? So another issue that a lot of people have been concerned with is the question you mentioned earlier about the about free will. So for thousands of years, philosophers have been faced with this question, and the question is. If everything that we do turns out to be completely determined, if every action that you take is completely caused by the way things were or in the universe earlier before you took that action, can you ever really be morally responsible for every, anything that you do? And philosophers have always been going back and forth about this with some saying, no, you can never be morally responsible if the things that you do are completely determined. And others saying the opposite, saying, Determinism, determinism, it doesn't matter whether what you do is determined, you can still be morally responsible for it. So what we wanted to know are, is what are the sort of underlying psychological roots of this conflict? What is it that's drawing people toward one side or to the other? Yeah, I wonder, um, there, there must be, a, a lot of what you're doing, it's, it falls definitely in the, the social psychology realm, but there's definitely a lot of, going to be a lot to be found, or at least that could possibly influence neuroscience as well. So uh, studies of the brain and what areas of the brain are active in certain mm-hmm. in certain situations. Right. So we haven't we haven't done that ourselves in the case of um, this question about um, determinism. But actually, there was an interesting recent study using neuroscientific methods to get at this issue. So what we argued was that there's something pulling people toward um, the answer yes, and something pulling people toward the answer no. And these are really different parts of our minds. So in our original study, we, I gave one group of people the question um, just on a purely abstract level. So we said, consider a completely deterministic universe, let's call it universe A. And then participants were asked, can anyone in that universe ever be morally responsible for anything we do? And people said, absolutely not. If it's completely determined, of course you can't be morally responsible. Hmm. Then participants in the other condition got a story that was supposed to be more concrete and sort of emotional. So participants were told, consider this universe that's completely deterministic, it's universe A. Now consider one particular person in this universe. His name is Bill. He falls in love with his secretary, so he decides to leave his wife and family. And then as a result, he decides to set up an incendiary device in the basement that's going to burn them all to death. Oh my God. Now, is, the question is, is this one guy, Bill, who lives in universe A, morally responsible for what he does? And what you see there is something really striking. People in the abstract case say that Bill um, is, that no one could ever be morally responsible for anything in a deterministic universe. But people in the concrete case say that this one guy, Bill, is morally responsible for what he did in the deterministic universe. So there have been some studies using neuroscientific methods, and what they're trying to get at is, what is the relevant difference between those two cases? Yeah. So why is it that people um, say that, that in the abstract, no one can be morally responsible in a deterministic universe, but in the concrete, that people can? I wonder what it is. Do they have, have, are, there any, are there any results that point at anything yet? Yeah, there are a whole bunch of different studies kind of getting at this issue. So one of the most recent looked at patients with a a neurological problem called frontotemporal dementia. Mm -hmm. So patients with frontotemporal dementia saw a blunting in their capacity for emotional response. So if something happened that made you really, really upset, if someone with FTD were in the same situation, that person would only feel a tiny bit of emotion, wouldn't really be affected nearly as much. So the question was, will patients with FTD show differences on this measure? And the answer is that they don't. They still say that the guy, Bill, who kills his wife and family is morally responsible for what he did. So these researchers then suggested, maybe what that shows is that he actually, that this this effect isn't really due to your anger at the person, 
but rather to certain kind of other factors that are purely cognitive or intellectual in nature. Right. And this, this is similar to the uh, the effect that you were talking about earlier in the show related to the moral <coughs> judgments the, um, that you found um, as a side effect. So mm -hmm. it, it, the, the, the damaged area of the brain, those individuals still had the same effect. So this is, this is there are the, it seems that there are these these responses that we have that aren't based in emotional reactions. Yeah, it seems like the issue has something more to do with yeah. whether you're thinking about it in a concrete, particular way or in a kind of abstract, theoretical way. So there right. are a lot of ways of manipulating that. But maybe one of the most subtle or funny ones is just with the font in which the question is written. Wow. So if you write out the question, say, in Arial, which is a very easy to read font, people tend to go through kind of quickly and then just in a very fluent way, they just end up sort of looking at the concrete details and making a judgment. By contrast, suppose you write out the question in Mistral, which is a very difficult to read font. Then the difficulty of the font makes people stop and think about it more and think about the question sort of more abstractly. Huh. And what you end up finding is that people tend to say that more that he is morally responsible when the question is written in Ariel and more that he's not morally responsible when the question is written in Mistral. Hmm. So, so letting people think about, I guess, mull it over a bit more and let the brain, as you said, uh, approach it in an abstract manner, yes, as, as opposed this... to a, the snap, judgment, concrete response. Right, exactly. So it seems like it's a matter of this kind of abstract mulling. When we get a chance to sort of mull it over and think things over, then we're less likely to have this immediate sense that people have to be to blame or morally responsible for the things that they do. So I, I'm i going to take this and suggest that all media be required to use really difficult to read font so that the 24-hour news cycle is counteracted. That's a great idea. Maybe, <laughs> maybe after people started to do that, there would be less of this rush to judgment that people have to, that when anything goes wrong, someone has to be to blame for it. Exactly. Seems like it seems like it's very rare in our 24-hour news cycle that something goes terribly wrong and people think, well, you know, things happen. Maybe sometimes someone, nobody knows to blame, just turned out badly. There's always this sense that someone has to be to blame for what occurred. We are getting towards the end of the show. Um, oh, yeah, I forgot one question that I was going to ask. The free will versus determinism. I mean you can approach this question and give people these universes that are, um, you know, that you're, that you're making up that are abstract and be like, okay, think about this, but in the free will versus deterministic question, hasn't it been answered yet? It's free will, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry to report to you that we haven't quite gotten the answer to the free will problem yet. Darn it. Okay. I, I've ta I've spoken to some other scientists and who are pretty convinced it's free will, but you know maybe the, I have to get my neuroscientists talking to my philosophers. I, I'd like that. <laughs> okay, so we're about at the end of the show, and I just want to say thank you so much, Josh, for joining me today. This has been a really really interesting conversation, and I've really enjoyed al almost the whole last hour. It's been almost an hour now. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, is is there your website the best place for people to look for more information about experimental philosophy, or is there uh, any place else that you would suggest sending them? Sure, you could go to um, the experimental philosophy page or to the experimental philosophy blog. Nice. I think that I think that would be a great place for people to to start looking if they're interested in experimental philosophy. And additionally, you have an article out in this month's uh, Scientific American, so that's if uh, people haven't picked up a copy of that, that uh, they can they can pick it up and and take a read this month. Um, I think that's it. So thank you so much for all the information on experimental philosophy. Really appreciated thank you. it. Thank you. And everybody else out there, this is the end of the Science Hour. Thank you very much for joining me this week. Next week, we're going to be talking about my favorite subject, the brain, with Dr. Lynn Paul from Caltech. There's some really interesting research out there that I think you'll be fascinated.
to learn about. So I hope you will join me next week. Until then, you can follow my sciencey pursuits on the internet. I am Dr. Kiki on Twitter, Dr. Kiki on Facebook, Kiki Sanford on Google Plus, and my website is drkiki.tv. You can also email me if you have a suggestion for a guest or if you have some interesting science videos that I might be interested in using for my science meditation, you can email me at drkiki at drkiki.tv. And uh, if you need more sciencey goodness, you can always download past episodes of this show at twit.tv forward slash kiki. You can subscribe uh, through iTunes, whatever your preferred podcast player is. I will see you next week. Thank you so much for joining me this week. And remember, all I ask is one hour a week because that one hour, I hope it makes your world a whole lot more interesting. And now for your science meditation of the week. And that was the X Fi anthem by Alina Simone, who is Josh's wife. <laughs> Coincidentally. <laughs> I think that's great. I love that I love that X Fi has an anthem. <laughs> I think it's great. You gotta have an anthem if you're really gonna get take it somewhere. And the uh, and the chair people in the chat room are hilarious. People are talking about the, the chair chairs pollute and whether or not the chair was performing self-immolation. <laughs> What's going on with the chair? So the, and I guess the symbolic aspect to answer people's question, the sim symbolism of the burning chair is to get philosophers out of the armchair, right? And to the streets, talking to people, like, like as Bill and Ted would have said, Socrates.